Yeah, we're now live. Okay, um, good, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this meeting of the Shropshire County Pension Fund. Firstly, I'd just like to apologise that we're 10 minutes uh, coming live. Uh, we've just been having a few technical glitches and we're still waiting for our presenters from Legal and General to actually be able to join us. So we, we that's that's why we've had this technical delay. So apologies about that. I am Tom Biggins, Chairman of the Pensions Committee. I'm obliged to inform you that this meeting is being live streamed and recorded. Members of the public will be able to hear the audio of the meeting and view the papers shown on the screen. This meeting is being held using remote technology and should any committee members experience technical difficulties during the meeting, they should immediately contact the designated IT officer on the number they have already been supplied with. Everyone is requested to mute their microphones unless asked to speak. Please only use the chat function to indicate the desire to speak. Do not use it for anything else so that it is clear who is asking to speak and the de debate has to be heard by those listening to the audio feed. The chairman will interpret the council's existing standing orders in light of the requirements of remote participation with advice from the monitoring officer prior to making a ruling. At the start of the meeting, members of the committee will be asked to confirm their presence and any disclosable pecuniary interests they have in any of the items on the agenda. Everyone that speaks during the meeting including members of the committee and officers, are asked to introduce themselves each time before they speak. This is so those listening know who is speaking. We'll now move on to the roll call and disclosure of pecuniary interests. Members are reminded to disclose any pecuniary interest in any matters to be discussed which is not included in the register of interests and leave the meeting by switching off their camera and muting their microphone prior to the matter being discussed. I will now ask the committee officer to read out each member's name and ask them to confirm presence and confirm if any interests. So Tim Ward, please. Thank you, Chair. I will now read them. The list of members. Uh, Thomas Biggins. Present and no pecuniary interests. Uh, Chris Mellings. Uh, morning Chairman, present and no interest to declare. Brian Williams. Present and no interest to declare. Michael Wood. Present and no interest to declare. Ray Evans. Present and no interest to declare. And Laura Hoskisson. Present, no interest to declare. Thank you, Chair. I will now ask officers, advisers and others expected at the meeting to confirm their presence, please. OK, um, uh, James Walton, uh, Interim Executive Director of Resources uh, and Pension Scheme Administrator. Present, Chair. Thank you. Justin Bridges, advisor to the committee. Thank you. Justin Bridges, Head of Treasury and Pensions, is present chair. Thank you. Debbie Sharp, um, Pensions Administration Manager, present chair. We, um, sorry, yes. Grant Patterson for Grant Thornton, the, the Funds External Auditors, present chair. Thank you. Um, and Terry Tobin, also from Grant Thornton, uh, present chair. Good morning. Thank you very much. Have we got Louis Paul Hill from Aon yet? Not yet, and we're still awaiting the members from Legal and Gen General, I presume. OK, uh, is there anyone else present who has not been mentioned? Yeah, uh, Councillor David Vasmer. 
OK, welcome, David. We'll now move on to apologies and substitutions. Can the committee officer confirm if there are any apologies and substitutions? Yes, Chair, we've had apologies from Councillor Malcolm Smith, Jean Smith and Byron Cook. Uh, there are no substitutions. Thank you very much. Uh, item two, disclosure of pecuniary interest. This has been dealt with during the initial roll call of the meeting. Item three, minutes of the previous meeting. Uh, I move that the minutes of the Pensions Committee meeting held on the 4th of December 2020 as circulated with the agenda papers be signed as a true, as a correct record. Can I have a seconder, please? Brian Williams here, I will second, Chairman. Thank you, Brian. I will now accept these minutes as a true record unless anyone else indicates differently. Nope, okay, well, I accept those in that case. Item four, public question time. We now move to public questions. We have received six questions that I will ask the head of Treasury and Pensions to read out. The interim executive director of resources will give the responses. So the first question is from Dr. Jamie Russell. Thank you, Chair. Justin Bridges, head of Treasury and Pensions. The question is, since Shropshire Council voted to divest its pension fund in July 2020, I understand that several other councils, including Telford and Rekin and Shrewsbury, have written to the Pensions Committee in support of this motion. Could the Pensions Committee kindly provide one, a full list of employers, including councils, it has received divestment requests from since 1st of July 2020? Two, an estimate of what percentage of employer contributions into the fund these councils represent when combined. And three, an insight into what percentage of employers would need to write to the Pensions Committee in order to trigger a commitment to pursue divestment by the Pensions Committee. Thank you very much and please may we have the response. Thank you, Chair. Uh, James Walton, Pension Scheme Administrator. Um, in answer to question one, um, uh, for transparency, I'll read the, the list of employers. So this is Shropshire Council, Telford and Reekin Council, Oswald Street Town Council and Shrewsbury Town Council. That's four uh, employers. Uh, in response to question two, employer contributions uh, amount to £27.049 million pounds, or 1.28% uh, of the total fund value, uh, which currently stands at £2.118 billion. Pounds. And in response to question three, responsibility for all decisions relating to Shropshire County Pension Fund rests with the Pensions Committee and not employers uh, of the fund. Four out of the uh, over 200 employers uh, within the fund have written to the fund, and that represents less than 2% of the employers uh, within the fund. Thank you. OK, th thank you. Moving on now to question two from Chris Welsh. You, you're muted, Justin. Justin. You, you're mu muted. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Justin Bridges, Head of Treasury and Pensions. The question is, who ultimately is legally responsible for the Shropshire Council, Council Pension Fund? The Council, the Pensions Committee or another body? And the response, please. Thank you, Chair. Administrator, Shropshire Council is the administering authority for Shropshire County Pension. Responsibilities for all decisions in respect of Shropshire County Pension Fund are delegated to the Pensions Committee. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. The third question is from Joe Blackman. Thank you, Chair. Justin Bridges, Head of Treasury and Pensions. The question is, I note that the Corporate Governance Monitoring Report to be discussed by the Pensions Committee on the 5th of March sets out a time frame which includes 3rd of December 2021, agree formal response to the Council motion. 
This is 17 months after the motion was agreed. What is the status of the committee's discussion of and or decision making via the council's divestment motion? Why is the committee apparently waiting 17 months to table discussion of the motion? Has the Pensions Committee commissioned any reports on the pros and cons of divestment, the likely impact on returns, balance of risks, etc.? If not, how will it ensure that divestment is given proper consideration as an alternative option to engagement when revising and agreeing its investment strategy and climate strategy, climate stewardship plan? OK, and the response, please. Thank you, Chair. James Walker, Pension Scheme Administrator. The status of the significant progress made to date regarding the Council's motion and timeline, timeline for future decisions, uh, Chair statements, public questions submitted and the responses provided and specific presentations on all of the above issues raised can be found by following the link to all the Pension Committee meetings on the Council's website. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we've got question four from Pat McCarthy and question five from Claire Cooper that I believe are being uh, asked but, but answered in one response. Thank you, Chair. Justin Bridges, Head of Treasury and Pensions. The first question is the February 2021 Divest UK report from Platform London and Friends of the Earth states Investing in fossil fuels is increasingly costly. It's a financial risk with UK public pensions losing two billion on oil investments in the last four years. It's also a political risk with the UK public more concerned about climate change than ever before. As a pension member with Shropshire County Pension Fund, I know the fund has a diverse portfolio and I welcome the prudent financial decision making that this demonstrates. However, I am perplexed to see the fund arguing for continuing investment in fossil fuels when weekly financial reports bring news of their fall in value, plus news of the steady rise in the value of renewables. Additionally, there is a constantly growing list of big institutions, companies and other pension funds who are divesting from fossil fuels. I personally believe that a pension fund that does not have a clear investment strategy which is in line with the Paris Agreement, is not fulfilling its fiduciary duty and is exposing pensioners to high risk as a result. I know many other pension holders who also want to see fossil fuel investment removed from the fund, as such, for the sake of their children and grandchildren and as their ethical duty, as well as for the financial sense it makes. To me, divestment from fossil fuels seems an obvious step that needs urgent action can you assure me that the fund is, will start divestment and transition to renewables no later than this year? What is stopping Shropshire County Pension Fund from instructing its investment managers to divest? That was, a, that was the first question, Chair. The, the second question uh, from Claire Cooper was, Mark Carney, the United Nations Envoy for Climate Action and Finance and former Governor of the Bank of England, has repeatedly warned investors in fossil fuels that they face potentially huge losses from climate change action that could make vast reserves of oil, coal and gas literally unburnable. He also said all companies and financial institutions must justify their continued investment in fossil fuels and warn that assets in the sector could end up worthless. And that's from The Guardian, 30th of the 12th, 2019. More recently, Carney warned that climate crisis deaths will be worse than COVID and stressed that as we emerge from the pandemic, the scale of investment in sustainable energy and sustainable infrastructure needs to double, which presents an enormous investment opportunity. And that's from BBC News, 5th of the 2nd, 2021. Since Shropshire County Pension Fund has such a diverse portfolio, why hold on to fossil fuels? Why not divest and reinvest in a sustainable future? That's the end of the question, Chair. Thank you. And the response, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, James Walton, Pension Scheme Administrator. Shropshire County Pension Fund believed that 
the climate risks and opportunities can be better addressed through modelling and careful analysis than with the blunt tool of divestment across an entire sector. While we understand the desire of some, some investors to simply walk away from the sector, we believe this may not be the best course of action for the following reasons. Number one, even though the energy transition is likely to impact some sectors more than others, we do not believe they should be considered in isolation. Indeed, it is our view that investment decisions should be informed by a comprehensive framework to evaluate climate risk and temperature alignment across all sectors. Many sectors can display long periods of underperformance that may or may not be followed by subsequent strong relative gains. This is why diversification remains an important tool for any long term investor in our view. And three, by divesting from entire sectors, investors lose their ability to exert a positive influence by active engagement. There is a growing body of evidence that suggests the assertion that this engagement can lead to significant positive change. And Leland in general will provide examples uh, of this uh, at today's meeting, which is at item eight on the agenda. Thank you, Chair. Right, thank you. And question six from Councillor David Vasma. Thank you, Chair. Justin Bridges, Head of Treasury and Pensions. In the Corporate Governance Monitoring Report, it sets out a framework which includes 3rd of December 2021. Agree formal response to the Council motion. Surely this should be considered before deciding investment strategies, climate strategies and stewardship plans. Could the Pension Committee itself commission a report on a case for divestment, the pros and cons, likely impact, impacts on returns, balance of risks, etc. OK, and the response, please. OK, thank you, Chair. Uh, James Walton, Pension Scheme Administrator. Work on investment strategies, climate strategies and stewardship plans needs to be undertaken first before the committee can make a formal response to the council motion. Several reports and presentations have already been received by the committee as part of the extensive review currently being undertaken uh, in this area. These reports and presentations have included some of the pros and cons of divestment and are available on the Council's website. A further presentation on these issues is being provided by Legal, uh, Legal and General at today's meeting. So please see item 8 on the agenda. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you for that. David, as you are a member of the council, do you have a supplementary at all? Uh, no, I don't actually. No, I don't. Thanks. Oh, OK, th th thank you. So that now concludes uh, public question time. So we'll now move on to item R five, informing the audit risk assessment for Shropshire County Pension Fund 2020-21. Um, may I ask Grant Thornton, please, to introduce themselves and present this item. Re over to Grant Thornton. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chair. This is Grant Patterson from Grant Thornton. Um, I'm just going to give a, a brief introduction to myself, to members, um, <coughs> as the Pension Fund's new engagement lead, and then I'll hand over to Terry Tobin to take uh, the committee through the actual report itself. Um, so just for members, my name is Grant Patterson. I've taken over from Richard Percival uh, as a pension funds uh, engagement lead. Richard's due to retire this year, which is clearly something that the uh, committee's uh, got a lot of experience in. Um, uh, I have previously been the engagement lead for the pension fund, um, but um, I've had uh, I've been away under ethical standards here for a sufficient period of time that I'm still considered to be, I'm now going to be independent and therefore I am returning um, as both the engagement lead for the pension fund and the council and probably given the, the makeup of the, the committee to say that I am also the engagement lead for Telford and Rekin Borough Council as well. Um, so I've had a lot of experience of, of working with you in the past, looking forward to working with you in the future um, and what I'll now do is hand over to, to well I have to take questions but I'm happy to hand over to Terry uh, Tobin to take you through uh, the first paper, which is the informing the audit risk assessment. Right, thank you, thank you, Grant. Good morning, everyone. Um, I am Terry Tobin. I'm senior manager at uh, Grant Thornton. 
Um, it's probably worth explaining what the uh, informing the audit risk assessment report actually is, as it may not be uh, too apparent to uh, many people, particularly those who you were uh, who've uh, uh, only been more recently involved. Um, as part of our audit planning, um, external auditors are required to ask questions of um, of management and also of pension committee members. Now, these cover several areas and include such things as fraud, legal issues and accounting estimates, and that helps uh, influence our audit plan. Now, rather than asking these questions individually, um, what we've uh, found over the years that it's perhaps more efficient and effective to to get management to answer all these questions in one report and put the results of this in front of you to give you the opportunity to comment if you want. So the format of this report is different to our other reports in that the, the questions are our questions, but the answers are from your officers, and that's probably really worth uh, emphasising. So uh, what we're asking you to do today is to consider whether the answers that you've seen in front of you are consistent with your understanding and, and whether there's anything further you would like to add in relation to them. And before I, I do this, um, I can hopefully, helpfully add that, um, you know, obviously we've seen a lot of these uh, responses from pension funds up and down the country. And I can say that in our view, the responses that we see here are comprehensive and reasonable. Um, I'll stop at this point to um, invite any uh, questions and comments and then allow you maybe to, to, to give your, your view on this report. Thank you. Do we have any questions, members? Uh, Laura Hoskison here. No, it, um, I had a good read through um, the agenda pack and um, I don't have any questions to offer. So well done on producing such a comprehensive document. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, Laura. Any anyone else? No, does, doesn't look like it, no. Um, I'm Chair, it's Grant Patterson here from Grant Thornton. I, I think, yeah, thank you for that comment, for the for the comprehensive re responses. I think we do see this as part of the two-way dialogue. Um, so uh, as the audit progresses, it is likely that there will be opportunities to come back to this. Um, one of the big changes you'll be seeing this year from the audit approach is there's new auditing standards around estimates. Um, where there's greater ch I suppose, challenge of, of management and understanding management assumptions. So I think there might be some there be opportunities to have conversations around this, especially I suppose, as you get towards the year end and the final um, auditing reporting um, in respect of understanding the estimates, because essentially the, the whole of the pension funds are, in most of it are estimates in terms of estimates of values uh, and liabilities. So there will be opportunities to, to pick this up as the audit progresses. OK, no, no, well, th thank you very much for that. Well, if if there aren't any further comments from from members, uh, we are asked to uh, note the report. Uh, please, may I have a proposer? Councillor Michael Wood proposed. Thank you. And a seconder. Councillor Chris Mullins, happy to second, Chairman. Thank, thank you both. I will now accept the recommendation of uh, and, uh, in the report, unless anyone else indicates differently. OK, well, in that case, I accept the report and I would just li like to thank Mr Tobin and Mr Patterson for their presentation to us this morning. Thank you. OK, OK, thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. We'll now move on to item six, uh, pensions administration monitoring. Uh, can Debbie Sharp introduce us health and present this item please. Thank you Chair, Debbie Sharp, Pensions Administration Manager. The Pensions Administration monitoring paper is for committee to note um, and gives a, 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 a quarterly update on all of the administration um, effects to the team. I just wanted to point out at uh, point 4.4, .4, the benchmarking uh, has been returned for the year 1920 and the 
cost per member is still below average for the Shropshire team for the, for the prop, prop, Shropshire pensioners at £19 per head rather than the average of 20 So that was good to see. At point seven, we've given an update there on the cyber security investigations that have been going on. Um, work has been undertaken by my team to check the funds cyber security against the pension regulators best practice guidance. We have undertaken um, to be part of a survey by Aon that is investigating against peers and will give us feedback against the um, uh, the assessment again against the regulators best practice. So that will be an ongoing topic this year because I think there's um, some areas that need to be documented. Um, the Shropshire IT uh, team are very thorough on the cyber security that they actually have in place for the fund, um, but we probably just need to document what the, what the fund um, has investigated. At point eight, the exit payment cap, there's an update there. The exit payment cap was introduced to limit exit payments from the public sector back in November last year to 95,000. That's now been revoked. So the team is undoing um, all of the processes that were put in place to cope with that. But uh, we're expecting to see an update later in the year. Uh, again, the guidance from the government is that they wish to ensure exit payments are limited from the public sector, so <laughs> this topic hasn't gone away. There's an update on McLeod, which is the remedy that's been um, decided upon for the public sector, which means the local government pension scheme regulations will need to be amended in, well, ongoing from March 2022. Uh, and there will be a remedy to apply to anybody who's already had a benefit between 2014 and the date of the legislation changes. So this year, a big undertaking for the team is to work with all of the fund employers to ensure that the data they've provided us will allow us to work out the um, remedy from next year onwards. Um, Item number nine, just to point out that um, we have checked back to uh, the reports that were presented at last committee. There was an error in one of the tables and um, we've corrected that now and we're just recording the deaths that we're actually going to report through to the local government association. And just wanted to point out there, sadly, in January in Shropshire, we have seen a spike on our pensioners um, dying with sadly the number rising to six. And at point 10, the GMP reconciliation and rectification exercise that all pension funds have had to do along with the government um, is nearing its end. We have now done all of the reconciliation and we had 123 members that needed their pensions altering. So um, that's less than 1% of our pensioner members. Uh, so the outcome was, was pleasing. And I'm happy to take any questions from the the members chair. Thank, thank you, <laughs> Debbie. Uh, members, have we any questions, please, for Debbie? Uh, Laura Hoskinson here. Uh, again, I don't have any specific questions for you, Debbie. I just wanted to say there were two points. Uh, first of all, while I'm personally really glad the removal of the 95 cap, I'm really sorry that it's uh, caused so much work for you. So well done for <laughs> getting through all of that and then having it reversed. Um, but I also just wanted to note that it's nice to see that Blueprint are uh, helping with some of the um, envelopes, envelope stuff and things like that. It's nice to keep it all in house, but also to help you guys uh, be more efficient in what you do. So there were two nice things I wanted to note. Thank you, Laura. Okay. Thank you, Laura. And any other questions? I, I've, I've just got one quick comment, and that is it's good to see more of our pensioners are, and deferred members, of course, are using the online facility. Um, is, is that steadily increasing as time goes by? It, it is, um, Chair, and we've nearly got 50% of active members, which, which is very good um, across pension funds completely, but it is an area that we are investing in and intending to actually increase because that is an area where we can save money in postage but also ensuring that members get information more quickly as well. 
So yes, I'm going to try and increase it, but our pensioner uptake isn't bad at all across the industry. Very good. And it is, it's great to see our costs uh, com when compared to uh, other local government pension funds are exceedingly good, exceedingly good. So well, well done, well done. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Just a point, if I may, Chairman, Councillor Michael Wood, uh, in 7.2, it's heartening to see that uh, our cyber security is so effective uh, and given the number of uh, threats against the uh, against the council directly numbering in some two billion um, and malicious attacks at five and a half million, uh, that it's good to note that uh, our systems are up to speed and are protecting not just the council, but also the pension fund. I think they are to be congratulated on that, Chairman. Yes, indeed. Thank you, Michael. A any, any other questions? No, well, in that case, the recommendation is that members are asked to accept the position as set out in the report. May I have a proposal, please? Councillor Michael Wood. Thank you. And a seconder. Brian Williams, I'll second. Thank you very much. I will now accept the recommendations as set out in the report unless anyone else indicates differently. I, I accept the recommendations there. Uh, moving on now to item seven, corporate governance monitoring. Um, can Justin Bridges introduce himself and present this item, please? Thank you, Chair. Justin Bridges, Head of Treasury and Pensions. Um, the Corporate Governance Report um, provides details on all the managers voting um, at annual meetings during the quarter and BMO's engagement with all, all the companies that the fund invests in. So all the details of that is provided in the appendices to the report. This is a regular report that the committee receives each quarter, so you should be familiar with it. I'd also like to draw members' attention to paragraph nine in the report regarding the update following the council motion that was passed in July 2020 and the extensive re re review currently being undertaken by the committee and the next steps which are highlighted in bold text in that table. So as you can see, um, in following the council motion, 24th of July, the Pensions Committee had a detailed um, presentation and report from LGPS Central on climate stewardship. And that the, the committee had further training on climate stewardship and the next steps. In the committee meeting on the 18th of September, we had a presentation from the director of RI at LGPS Central, and um, that report um, provided detailed analysis of the pension fund's carbon footprint. And um, we, obviously, there was detailed climate risk analysis undertaken as part of that report as well that was presented to committee. Also at that meeting, we also agreed the investment strategy review and the responsible investment timetable. And that was presented by Aon and members agreed to the timeline within that report. We've also had in, on the 4th of December, we've had a, a public TCFD report, which was presented by um, LGPS Central again. And we've had media releases and details sent to all employers on the update. Um, following that public uh, TCFD report. We've also had presentations from BMO at that 4th of December meeting on the engagement and the pros and cons of engagement versus di divestment and various different case studies. And then our UK equity manager Majedi also presented again about why they hold certain stocks within our portfolio and those stocks highlighted in the, the public TCFD report that we released. So going forward, we've got at today's meeting, we've got legal in general. So um, legal in general will provide another update and further training on the investment stewardship. And then going forward from here in bold in that table, it, it just states what the committee, what work the committee will be doing. So in, on the 25th of June, we're going to begin the implementation of our revised investment strategy once this is agreed. And then in September, we're going to have the Shropshire County Pension Fund is going to have its own climate strategy and climate stewardship plan. And then at the meeting on the 3rd of December, obviously after this, this extensive review, we're going to review all the analysis, review all the training undertaken, make sure the recommendations in the TCFB report have been implemented 
and agree a formal response to the council motion at that meeting. There's also been a number of public statements made by the chair, lots of public questions and member questions, which have all been responded to, and all the links to the report, um, these presentations, reports, chair statements, are all on the council's website. So I'm happy to leave it there and take any questions at that point, chair. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jesse. Are, are, are there any questions, please, members? Uh, Laura Hoskinson here again. Yep, yes, Laura. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's been really good to have the presentations from uh, BMO and Legal and General and those sort of things that have come through, and I'm really glad to have been been there for them um, in both sessions. Uh, one thing I have noted, we've seen an awful lot from people who already provide services to us in terms of giving us information. We haven't seen much from the divestment side. So in terms of having an, an equal argument, is I feel it's been quite heavily weighted from one point and not from the other viewpoint. I think that would be something that might be uh, helpful to try and address sooner rather than later um, as we're going into doing our climate strategy in September. Yes, that, that's a point well made. I, I think we'll, we'll take that on board, Laura. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Chair. Any other questions, please? Yeah, yes, please, Chairman uh, Chris Mullings. Uh, just to sort of follow up Laura's comments in, in support of, uh, of that, um, it, it's been helpful to flesh out the, the work that has been done um, to date around this issue and quite clearly the, the issue about divestment in uh, fossil fuels is a, a very live issue as we know from our individual post bags and from questions and other things to, to this meeting. And, and I think there's been a, an understandable sort of frustration, uh, as we've heard earlier today, in terms of the time scales um, from the, the point at which we started with the council debating a motion. Obviously, the timetable uh, that's been uh, the historic timetable to a degree has sort of set out how we've approached that. So I think it's been useful to explain to the to, 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 to people as the process of the journey we're on. However, the issue of fossil fuels is quite a specific uh, one. Um, and as Laura has indicated, we've had a very clear steer around engagement and that appears to be the um, preferred option. But there's an equally strong case and some of us might argue an even stronger case uh, for uh, divestment. And quite clearly by their nature, um, um, for fossil fuel companies to become carbon neutral is a huge challenge because they're, they're if we're frank about it, the, the whole basis of their uh, business is, is about burning carbon. So how, how you actually transition that, and I know there has been some um, some work and some, some companies have uh, given an indication towards that, but I think we still have to acknowledge that I think that for every statistics show that for every pound invested in uh, fossil fuel companies, 95 pence of that goes into expanding further oil and gas production. So as I say, it's a real um, live issue and I just, wonder and it may be that I'm misunderstanding the process that we're that we're going through that why as a principle once we agree the investment strategy today the timetable says that we'll then start to implement that well obviously investments will be made and presumably that would still apply to fossil fuel companies clearly and it depends on which side of the fence that you sit on this there is a clear economic argument and an ethical argument for divestment and I just wonder why it is that we have to wait till December and that we can't as a principle agree to divestment as part of agreeing the, 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 the strategy. So it is clear. Now, I know the motion sort of set out a three year period for us to divest and you could argue that by leaving it to December, you're within that. But as I say, quite clearly, there is this is a huge live issue um, for um, people. Um, and we do need to have that debate as a committee um, between the principle of, in, of engagement, which in some respects has positives. Obviously, ESG is a, as a whole range of things, um, not just about this, but 
the whole issue of fossil fuels is is is, is not a single issue per, per se, but as I said earlier, by the nature of it, um, has a very clear impact. And we wouldn't be the first pension fund that has gone down this route. All sorts of pension funds from 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 local authorities to um, um, to, to other organisations uh, are following this uh, this process. And there is a clear financial risk that um, that if that if we don't both to, um, um, to, to to the pension fund and the employers, but also to, um, to to pensioners as well. So it would be just useful just to sort of flesh out why it's not possible to consider divestment as a principle as part of our um, investment strategy today, rather than waiting to set, uh, December for that to happen. Sorry, that's a bit long winded, Chairman, but um, I, I hope that helps contribute to the debate. Thank you. Yeah, yes, thank, thank, thank you, Chris. Um, do officers want to come in this stage? Um, uh, I, 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 I think the reality is climate change, climate risk is, is just one of the many different aspects that we do need to look at and we do need to understand. Um, I personally think it's the right thing to do. We've, we've got a programme that we've that set out and We've got three meetings ahead of us, and I, I, I do accept Laura's point that we do need to hear the divestment argument specifically so we can take that into account in our deliberations. But I don't feel that we have yet had all the information presented to us so that we as a committee are in a position to actually make a, a measured um, decision, whatever that may be. Um, James, I'm, I'm happy to come in, Chair, if that, James, uh, yes. if that helps. Thank you. Uh, James Walton, Pension Scheme Administrator. Uh, just to just to reassure the board, um, at the, the committee, uh, really, and everyone listening, um, in terms of uh, the, the, the investment strategy decision, this is about setting out our overall strategy for managing the risks of the pension fund. So we're talking about a two, two billion pound fund. And within that, there are huge risks uh, that we have to have to manage. And the way in which you manage that is by diversifying that, that portfolio. Um, so that's about decisions like how much uh, do we invest in infrastructure, in private equity, in, in equities, in, in uh, um, uh, you know, um, uh, property, et cetera, et cetera. There's, there's a whole series of different areas that we would look to invest in, in terms of the investment strategy to manage that risk. None of that then suggests anything in relation to what individual decisions we make about the individual investments within those sectors. So deciding on whether, for example, 20% of our, uh, our fund goes in equities or 80% of, of, of the fund goes in equities or anything in between doesn't then say that those equities can't then be absolutely divested from uh, fossil fuel companies or, or whatever decisions we want to, to take about uh, ethical um, or sustainable um, uh, investment. So what's important is you kind of set that overall framework and get that agreed so that we are clear that we are managing the overall risk. And then uh, it is a very, very important issue, but as was pointed out by, by Councillor Mellings, it is a single uh, issue and there are lots and lots of risks uh, that we need to manage. So if we if we you know created an investment strategy purely starting from that point of view, we would actually be not uh, not not undertaking the correct risk uh, analysis and risk management that we need of the, the 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 portfolio as a whole. And so hopefully that gives some some assurance to the uh, to the um, uh, to the committee that making decisions on the investment strategy does not in any way um, uh, conflict or, 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 or constrain the amount of freedom we then have in terms of the individual decisions within those particular areas to meet the, the, the significant challenge of climate change. Thank you for that. Are there any other questions on this paper, please? No, well, well in, in that case, uh, we're asked to accept the position as set out in the report. Manager voting reports at Appendix A, A1, A2 and A3 and BMO Global Asset Management Responsible Engagement Overlay Activity Report at Appendix B, B1 and B2. Please may I have a proposer? 
Michael Wood uh, proposed John. Thank you. And the seconder? Brian Williams seconds Chairman. Thank you very much. I will now accept the recommendations as set out in the report <coughs> unless anyone else indicates differently. I, I therefore accept the recommendations. Thank you. We are now on item eight, uh, investment stewardship. Can the representatives from legal in general introduce themselves and present this item, please? You have Sasha Sedan here, the Director of Investment Stewardship. Hello, Sasha. Hello, I think in the context of time, because of um, your, I think I'll just crack on if that's the best yes, way. Yes, please do, please do. Um, and it seems a long time ago, November. Uh, you, you're able to hear me? 20, and Yasmin is here as well, my colleague, and I can hear her as well. Um, uh, it seems a long time ago, November 2019, when I came up and we had a very good discussion in the public and I just wanted to carry that on. So it's a shame we can't do it in public, but I promise I'll come as soon as life allows us to come back again. Um, I'll just go straight to the slides. Look, I do understand we have been doing this job for a very long time and we're the probably the most passionate people when it comes to climate change. We have been we had a climate change conference five years ago when people weren't really wanting to talk about it too much to say this is going to be one of the biggest issues. We've hired, we did our own TCFD report in 2018, so three years ago, because we said this was important. We've just committed to being net zero. We understand what kind of issues that you are going through, and hopefully I can answer some of them as we go through. But just for one minute, I'd like to say there are many, many, many other issues that are very important and to clients as well, such as diversity, inequality, supply chain, and although we can't talk about them all today, we do take them just as seriously. And I think it's very important that we talk about all of these issues and work them on whatever investments we have with you. And this is not an equity debate or a credit debate. This is all about your assets in general. And all companies have equities, but they also have debt. And we also push them on their debt in general. So I think that's very important. So lots of topics. But I do think we're known for our scale and I think it's very important for this debate about influence that we use our scale and you can be big but not use your bigness or your size to do this and I think you can build long-term relationships so I am I've got a meeting straight after this with the chairman of Daimler Mercedes and we've been talking to them for many years about how they can go for electrification so I know there's a lot of debate about fossil fuels but banks auto manufacturers, food companies where there's deforestation, they are all very, very important in this chain and actually very important and sometimes get overlooked. And I really think that's important that we don't overlook all the chain and not just focus on one area. But I will mention oil and gas companies, I promise. Um, but I do think it's very important. And then when you have votes and you have influence, you should use them. And you know we don't abstain and we vote very aggressively where we need to. We vote against chairman and Jasmine will pass that on later. Um, on slide three, when we talk about engagement, we meet lots of companies. We don't just listen to them, we target them. We say, you are not doing a good job. We want to meet you. We're one of your largest investors and we will vote against you if you don't disclose or change. And I'll give some examples of that. And yes, we do name and shame and we've named and shamed some oil and gas companies. Not many asset managers will publicly name and shame. And we've named and shamed Exxon. We've named and shamed Occidental in the past and Dominion Energy. These are very big companies who are very important in changing climate. And we voted against their chairman. We've made it personal. We've told them that you're not good against your oil and gas rivals. So I think that's a really important point. We are differentiating inside a sector as well as just saying one sector is important because by the way, I think banks are one of the most important areas as well. We've got a side on Barclays, but if they fund or coal-fired power stations, then we aren't going to solve this. So it's finance as well. And I know somebody on the questions before mentioned Mark Carney. Well, we're working very closely and we did do with Mark Carney on responses. And my colleague is seconded for COP26 in Glasgow for November, specifically on finance solutions 
It is about coming up with solutions and doing this now. We have not got time. We have to work quickly, but we have to change the companies that are involved in this. And, and just leaving the tent means that they'll carry on doing this. And we really can't allow that, especially in 2021. Time for action. I will go straight slide. Um, I'm going to go straight to slide five. And I've just mentioned that we've done a lot of work on income inequality. We are pushing companies for the living wage and we're doing lots of work on diversity and ethnicity. Um, I'm just going to quickly go to slide eight and say we've done a lot on climate. So specifically for your questions, we've been ranked externally as doing a very good job, but that doesn't mean anything. We can always do more and we need others to do more. And I value these questions and these challenges. We have put big, ambitious targets in our own group. We're one of the first to put net zero targets in our in our house building business, in our big asset owner business ourselves. And we have good coal exclusion policies. Um, I've talked about the climate pledge and I'll let Yasmin talk about that in a minute. But we're working with all of the great organisations and we've always been big collaborators because we can't do this on our own. Climate Action 100 and we were announced only a few months ago as one of the leaders by the PRI, the United Nations PRI, as a leader on climate, as a leader group. And we were the largest asset manager in the world to be um, praised for that. But it's not about that. And we are coming up with many solutions because it is difficult and we see many asset owners wanting to do more. They don't want us just to do the minimum. They don't just want to be involved. And there are many solutions that we can talk about trying to model a low carbon future. But in my view, it does mean that we have to influence the existing companies because they are going to be around for the next 20 years and we need to change them. And I'm going to go through an example of that in a minute. But Yasmin, if you'd like to talk on slide six, please. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm just making sure that you, you can hear me because I, I had some IT issues dial, dialing in. Um, but, so, yeah, ho hope you can hear me OK. Yeah, yes, we can. Great. OK, um, so, yeah, so uh, on, on slide six, as, as Sasha mentioned, um, we have been for the past two years uh, heavily focused on uh, developing our in-house modeling capabilities. So um, enable, enabling us to build build out uh, our analytics capabilities uh, with regards to what does uh, an energy system that is aligned with the goals of the Paris Agreement. So an energy system uh, that, that is aligned with a, a 1.5 degree uh, trajectory pathway. What, what does the energy system in terms of cars on the road, the types of cars on the road, um, air, air, air miles flown, uh, what does the energy mix look like in China and in India and in the United States and so on? What, what does the global energy system look like that is aligned with this 1.5 degree pathway? Um, and our own modeling, uh, as well as that of, of, of uh, leading third parties that, that also do great work on this, we all come to the same conclusion that oil markets certainly face a, a, a very uncertain um, future, but even in a 1.5 degree uh, scenario, they are likely, oil and gas is likely to still play a key role in the global energy system. So uh, use uh, or, and consumption will go down, but it is likely to still be there even in 2050 and even uh, in, in a 1.5 degree uh, scenario, even though, uh, as, as I said, consumption will be much lower uh, than it would have been uh, in a business as usual scenario. Um, and so based on this modeling and, and, and the trajectory that we see for, for the sector, we engage very closely with the leading oil and gas companies in the world. And I'll, I'll hand back to Sasha to, to talk you through how, how that has looked with uh, BP. Look, I mean, I'm, I'm just, being frank, we've had to have many very candid conversations. We've voted against BP on pay in the past. We've challenged them on their governance. If you get the wrong people at the top of a company, then it's really hard for them to come up with the targets. But we were involved in the chairman search on slide seven. We were also involved in the CEO. Now we have a new chairman and a new CEO. Some of the targets they've put out there now, they are an oil and gas company, but we've stopped them lobbying. They're now committed to not lobbying against the things we've wanted. They are now putting, they're going to reduce those. For one of the questions we had before, 40% reduction in production by 2030, so in the next nine years. 
this is the way to reduce carbon emissions. Yes, it isn't going to zero yet. It will do by 2050. They've committed to it. It is in their pay packet. They're now being incentivized to reduce their carbon. And if we are going to change climate and get towards net zero, we need the biggest polluters to reduce by 40% by 2030. And if we'd have left the building, I personally don't think we would have got BP to do this. Now, I'm not saying we did it on our own, but we did put Elgin with Hermes did put the shareholder resolution on the table in 2019, so years ago, pushing them and fighting them and telling them they needed to do more, which helped get there. They are now going to spend 10 times more on renewable energy. So I do think we are trying to do that, but not all companies are doing this. Total are doing a good job. Shell are starting very much to do this as well. But Exxon, Dominion Energy and others are not doing that. And therefore, we do need to challenge them. We do need to vote against um, Exxon literally at the moment has a shareholder resolution with new directors put up by um, very good uh, NGOs and activists, which we are pushing for to get people on their board who will do something because the existing board of Exxon, as we've publicly said, has not done enough and we voted against. But they are so, I mean, they are worried about this slate of directors that they've now come up with some new directors that are at least better than the ones um, that they've got at the moment for thinking about net zero. So the influence side is the only way to get some of these things. But of course, you need the stick of voting against and having that area. And so I just wanted to pass that on. If I go to the climate pledge and I'll leave this to Yasmin on slide nine. Great. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll talk you through um, our, our flagship climate related engagement program. So, so this is this is what we call the, the climate impact pledge. And we launched this in 2016. Um, with a commitment that was, at least to our knowledge, the first time a mainstream asset manager uh, committed to uh, uh, a model of engagement with consequences on on climate change. So we said right from the from the very start that um, we're going to have a conversation and um, we're we're going to share with companies where we think they need to take action. But right from the onset, we said you know we're not going to be having a conversation for forever if we do not see. Uh, tangible action and improvement, um, we we will use the escalation levers that, that we have uh, at our disposal. Um, and so that model essentially looked um, in the sense that we took um, six sectors that, that are critical to climate change, so your oil and gas, your autos, electric utilities, but also food um, and, and financials, and we developed a proprietary assessment criteria, which we um, tailored very, very closely to the TCFD framework. Um, and we assessed companies on, um, on, on, on this framework and, um, and then uh, engaged with them to share the results of our analysis, to share with them you know, where, where we believe that they uh, were, were falling behind, either their peers or, or simply where the sector as a whole wasn't meeting our, our expectations in terms of uh, what is actually required to be aligned with the Paris Agreement target. Um, and um, for, for those companies where after a period of engagement, we didn't see improvement, uh, we would vote against their, their chairperson across the entirety of Elgin's uh, equity, uh, equity holding. So as, as Sasha said, really made it, made it personal. Um, and we also came out publicly to, to name and shame the, these companies in, in the media. And I think what's been really encouraging uh, on the back of this engagement program is that we have been able to see and track quantitatively the effects of this model of engagement with consequences. Um, so as you can see on uh, on slide slide nine, uh, the companies that were sanctioned were actually the companies that made the greatest improvements in terms of their their quantitative scores on on this assessment framework that that we've uh, developed. Um, and and, and that trend holds true both across sectors uh, and across countries, as, as you can see on, on slide 10, that uh, over time, um, uh, all of the, so us applying this model of engagement with, with consequences has meant that we've been able to, across sectors and con countries, really track uh, quantitatively this, this continued improvement in, in, in practices. Um, and I'm, I'm going to go on. So even though, even though we have seen uh, and been able to, to sort of evidence the success of this engagement program, we still think it's, it's important to um, continue to evolve and, and to, to continue to push best practice. 
Um, so I'll go in in a second uh, on, on what that looks like and what the involvement of this engagement program looks like. But I'm, I'm aware Sasha is, is running to meet the, the chairman of Daimler. Earth. So I just wanted to let him come in uh, quickly on. Yeah, on board thank you. Before I thank you. I, I did touch on finance, but I think finance is extremely important when we're going to try and solve this. I mean, unbelievably difficult issue of climate and, and getting towards net zero. And a good example, we men could mention JP Morgan, I could mention HSBC, but here Barclays, we've pushed very hard on Barclays, we've voted against them on pay in the past, and we've voted against them on chairman on many things because of some of the issues that we've had in the past, but Barclays is a big funder of oil and gas and fossil fuels, and we've pushed them along with their share action and others to try and be more ambitious. And with the new chairman that we have in, Nigel Higgins, we absolutely have got last year a much stronger commitment with targets linked to the CEO's pay. And we endorse this proposal as well as the share action proposal at Barclays. This is really important because we do need, they have big business in Houston, Texas. They do make lots of profits from this, but we do need them to reduce, move out of it and get known and push for this. We have just seen some amazing targets from Santander and BNP Paribas. We need banks and we need insurance to also be involved in these things. And, and, and I apologize, I'm going on to the call with Daimler now because I'm pushing them literally as we speak on their electrification program, how they're going to be linked, how they're working with the oil and gas companies to have more quicker electric pumps, or not, not even pumps, are they now, charging devices, so that we can have a quicker take up, so that we can get closer to this. And we're using National Grid, our biggest utility in the UK, to help l link this as well all over Europe, because we have to have this investment chain of all of us. And as Guy Oppenheimer, the pensions minister, said yesterday in the FT, it's all of us need to work together a lot better than we have done to try and build this chain. And he wants us to influence and attack, if we need to, companies rather than exit. And I thought that comment in the FT was quite useful yesterday. So I'll hand back to Yasmin to go on with this. But thank you very much. And I look forward to coming back very soon to, to see you all in person. OK, thank you for that. Great. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Sasha. Um, so yes, I'll, I'll move us on to, to slide 11, um, talking, uh, as, as I mentioned, about how, how we're continuing to, to evolve uh, this engagement program. Um, so. In March of last year, when the COVID pandemic hit, um, I think that really brought home to us, as it, as it did for, for many others, I'm sure, um, the potential economic consequences that, that natural catastrophes can, can have. And it, it spurred, um, I think, a, a moment of, of essentially taking stock of our climate engagement. So we, we knew we had uh, an engagement program that, that had been successful. We could, as I said, track the, the tangible um, impacts of it. Um, but we still thought, you know, as, as one of the largest financial institutions in, in, in Europe, is there something else that we can do? Can we push this further? Um, and so with that in mind, we, we decided to launch this, this new version of the Climate Impact Pledge. And, and there are a few um, characteristics that um, are, are key to this new version. Um, so one of the things is that we now have, when, when we started the Climate Impact Pledge in 2016, the ESG data um, landscape was very, was very different than what it is today. Um, and that meant that by definition, the process of, of assessing companies on climate change had to be manual, had to be desk research, uh, and, and, and as a result, of course, very time consuming. And, and there, therefore, we were also limited in, in, in the scope. Um, but uh, to date, the ESG data, data landscape has, has evolved to such an extent that we now have uh, data points available to us in, in a comparable format and in, in an Excel sheet um, uh, format uh, available across thousands of companies. Um, and that means that we are able to a, widen the sectors, um, for, first of all. So we've gone from six sectors to, to 16. Um, and, and another key thing that we're doing is that we are um, we're really deepening the impact. So trying to cut out a little bit of the noise around you know disclosure and tick boxes and so on, and really focus and hone in on what is actually the central challenge here. What are we actually trying to achieve? Um, and that is, of course, 
to engage with these companies to encourage them to align their strategies with what is required under net zero by 2050 uh, trajectory. So the, the new engagement program has a, has a much sort of more laser focus, if you will, on are, are you committing to net zero by 2050? Are you evidencing um, that this commitment is, is legitimate by, by evidencing CapEx spend, R&D spend, and, 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 and so on being allocated to, to the technologies required to meet this target? Um, and, and can we see ultimately the impact of this target play out in, in shifts in, in your revenue split and, um, and executive pay and, and, and so on? And those are, I think, some of the key things. And then um, we are also, because we now have this, um, these new great data sets available to us that, that we didn't a few years ago, we're also able to set really clear red lines. Uh, so essentially to say, you know, if, if you're in a climate critical sector and you don't have a greenhouse gas emissions reduction target, then that's an automatic vote against essentially. Um, and so we're, we're really in a, in a great position now with these new data sources uh, at, at hand to, to really set clear red line across climate critical sectors for all companies in those sectors that, you know, even if you are not hearing from us directly, even if we do not have capacity to engage with 1,000, 2,000 issuers, if you are in a climate critical sector, these are simply our expectations uh, in terms of, of board oversight of climate, in terms of setting targets, uh, in, in terms of evidencing uh, a reduction in emissions intensity and so on. And those companies that, that do not meet those requirements will be, be sanctioned uh, uh, via, via votes that apply to all the Belgium's equity holdings. Um, and we're also, lastly, one of the key things uh, about how we're revamping this engagement program is, is a commitment to radical transparency. So I think investors for many years have said to companies, you know, we need you to disclose, we need you to, uh, to show us that you're doing ABC. Um, and, and in that vein, we wanted to, to apply that same standard to ourselves. So now um, anyone can go into the climate, Algium Climate Impact Pledge uh, microsite and see what are the indicators that we use to assess companies um, and uh, how do we assess companies on, on those metrics. So it's, it's essentially a, um, a public website with a traffic light system. So you can put in any company like BP or, or Daimler um, or uh, McDonald's um, and, and essentially see the metrics that we use to assess them and whether we think um, they are uh, lagging behind uh, in, 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 in kind of somewhere in the middle uh, or, or leading by a, a red, amber, green traffic light system. Um, so that I think is a, is a key point uh, that, that we've committed to that this, this point about radical transparency, it, it applies not just in terms of what we expect from companies, but also the standard that, that we hold ourselves to. Um, and I, I wanted to flip quickly uh, to another case study because I do think, you know, beyond the kind of statistics and quantitatively how we can track uh, impact and so on, I do think it, it is really important to hone into the individual case studies. So taking a, a company like Subaru, for example, on, on slide uh, 13. Um, so this is a company that we engaged with uh, over several years uh, as part of the Climate Impact Pledge. And, and when we first um, started speaking with them on, on climate risk in 2017, um, they had no disclosure or discussion in their public reporting around uh, what are the risks of climate change to their business. They had absolutely no articulation of a hydrogen or, or EV or alternative powertrain strategy. Um, and, and, and importantly or crucially, uh, there was a significant gap between them and, and also their regional peers. So even uh, sort of among Asian companies, they, they were really, uh, or Asian automakers, they were really falling behind. Um, and as a response to this, we had several conference calls with them and, and multiple uh, in-person meetings uh, with them at their Tokyo office uh, over more than two years. And we also voted against their, uh, their chair, again, across Elgin's equity holding, both in um, um, 2018 and 2019, and uh, again, went, went public in the media, in, in Japanese media, naming and shaming um, this, this company as, uh, as a laggard. Um, and as a result, uh, in May of last year, um, we were able to see some really impressive progress. So uh, they came out uh, with a target to reduce uh, their well-to-wheel emissions, so the emissions from, from their fleet, 
uh, by by 90 percent uh, and, and a very ambitious sales target that 40 percent of global sales will be electric or hybrid by 2030 um, and that uh, in the first half of the 2030s uh, electrification technologies will be applied to all of their vehicles sold um, worldwide so this is a great example i think about uh, of the, the power of engagement you're able to take a company uh, going from really uh, being a laggard and, and, and falling behind its peers to actually uh, setting some uh, some best practice targets ultimately. Um, and moving on to slide 14, um, slight change of pace, um, but it, it is a topic that I think is, is really critical uh, to talk about when we talk about climate change. So I think very often the conversation gets stuck around oil and gas. Uh, automakers, electric utilities, and so on, and we, we hone in on the energy-related emissions, and we forget about the 25% uh, of global emissions that, that are actually caused by uh, um, land use changes, so agriculture, forestry, and, and, and other land use emissions, they're, they're called. Um, and this is really a key piece of the puzzle. So meeting the, the aims of the Paris Agreement uh, to, to meet net zero emissions by 2050 will be absolutely impossible uh, without tackling and reversing deforestation. Um, and, and indeed, the IPCC report on, on a 1.5 degree uh, pathway uh, suggests that reforesting an area the size of India might in fact be, be necessary to, to meet the 1.5 degree target. Um, and of course, uh, deforestation has strong links to biodiversity in the sense that deforestation is the, the most significant driver of biodiversity loss and halting deforestation is, is essentially the most important thing that we can do to halt also biodiversity loss. Um, so tackling this, um, this quarter of the emissions pie, if you will, is, is something that we've been very much focused on for, for several years. We have been a longstanding member of um, joint investor initiatives engaging uh, on uh, soy, cattle, and palm oil supply chain, so all three commodities that, that are really uh, significant drivers of, of deforestation. Um, we have in, been engaging with food companies as part of the Climate Impact Pledge since 2017, and, and indeed um, there are four food companies that have been um, sanctioned, voted against, and, and publicly shamed um, due to a lack of deforestation policies and, 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 and climate efforts. Um, we're, we've also been engaging jointly with uh, Brazilian companies such as JBS um, on uh, rooting out deforestation from, from their ca cattle supply chain because um, actually stopping deforestation uh, in globally important biomes such as the, the Amazon, again, are, are really critical to, to meeting global decarbonization goals. Um, and something that we're very excited about in, in this work stream was that in 2020, we were able to join um, a, a global investor initiative calling on the Brazilian government to actually step up to the plate and make sure that the regulations that they have in place to protect the Amazon rainforest uh, are actually adhered to and that people who, who violate those regulations are actually sanctioned because what you see in that market right now is, is often a state of impunity, essentially, that, that the government isn't going after um, individuals that are caught uh, illegally deforesting. Um, and so, so we signed a, a joint investor initiative and, and on the back of that have had um, two conversations with the vice president uh, of Brazil, as well as, uh, as other cabinet uh, ministers and, and members of Congress. Um, and it, it's still early days and we're, we're certainly very closely following um, the, the development there, but it's, it's, uh, we're, we're sort of uh, cautiously optimistic, I think. Um, so yeah, so just just to wrap up that that piece of, of the emissions puzzle that that I do think is, is really really critical to talk about the the land use piece and, and not just uh, uh, energy and, and oil and gas. Um, and I'll, I'll wrap up um, on slide uh, 15 um, with um, just uh, essentially a slide to say that I think. We, we have seen that we've been recognized in, in multiple external rankings as, as we really a leader on, on our with regards to climate stewardship efforts. And I think what um, why that is, is because we take this model of engaging, engaging with consequences that we say from the outset, we're not just going to have a conversation. If we don't see action, uh, we will use the, the levers that, that we have available to us to escalate. And also, crucially, as Sasha mentioned, uh, we dovetail engagements with portfolio companies, also with policy engagements, because we know meeting the net zero by 2050 target is going to require investors, it's going to require the private sector, but also, crucially, we need the right regulations in place. 
across sectors, across markets um, to, to really get us there. There, hence, hence why, you know, really dovetailing of uh, engagements with, with policymakers is, is really part and parcel of, of, of what we do. Um, so yeah, I I realize we're we're getting close to the to the hour. So let me wrap up there and just see if if, if there are any questions. Yes, are, are there questions, please, members? Yes, Chairman Councillor Brian Williams here. Um, would um, our friends from Legal and General indicate if they think there's more the you the uh, UK government can do on deforestation. I must say that of all the aspects of uh, uh, pressure for um, climate change uh, policy, uh, I regard deforestation as one of the most urgent, yeah. certainly mm. as urgent as the work we're doing with uh, oil and gas companies. Um, is there more that the British government could do uh, by uh, economic measures to bring pressure on the Brazilian government? Because it seems to me that with the leader they have, uh, who cares nothing for the consequences of climate change to our world, that unless economic pressures are brought upon him, uh, not only from our government, but from governments across the world, there is little hope that anything will change in Brazil. Yeah, no, I, I, I do think um, there is more certainly that, that the UK government can do and, 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 and uh, certainly working in, in collaboration with uh, the European Union, um, but there, there's plenty more they can do to, uh, to put pressure on, on the Brazilian government. But I think another key thing uh, that is, is equally important to explore is the socioeconomic issues on the ground in, in the Amazon and, and in the Cerrado that you have uh, farmers uh, that have taken out mortgages to buy land uh, on, on with the understanding that they would be able to utilize them. And now because we because of climate concerns, um, you know, we need uh, crucially those those landscapes and, and those forests to to remain intact. And there I think um, international governments have a role to play in thinking about, you know, what are the financial mechanisms that we can set up to support, to incentivize farmers and, and compensate them um, for, for, for keeping the, the land intact. So, so essentially some kind of uh, nature-based climate uh, financing <coughs> is, is really, really required there and, and, and a mechanism that compensates farmers, uh, not for tearing, tearing the, the landscape down, but that actually compensates them for, for the value of the carbon that's stored on, on their land. And that's one thing I think the UK and, uh, and, and international uh, governments could, could take, really take a leadership position. Thank you. Are, are there any other uh, questions, please? I, I've, I've got one question. Um, um, looking at the global um, uh, carbon emission situation, I, I think it's fair to say China is one of the three key uh, contributors to climate change. The UK is tiny, tiny in com comparison to uh, the, the fact that China seems to be building coal power fire stations to every week what what can be done to actually um help the chinese cut down their uh carbon emissions because it, it without without tackling the big carbon producer what what we do say in europe and, and, and the west it, it, we, we we're not really making much difference yeah, no, I think I think that's that's a really good question, and it, it, it's really a very interesting topic. So I think, um, in a, in a lot of ways, when um, when the economics of, of renewables and, and and energy storage continues to improve, uh, a lot of those issues will will hopefully iron them, themselves out uh, just just on a, on an economic principle in in, in the future. 
but it is something that, that we are very, very actively in, in, involved in engaging both with Chinese financial institutions and engaging with uh, um, Chinese electric utilities to say that, you know, e even if the, the calculus for, for you today might seem like it's in a, in a slight gray area, we also know that China um, is um, is going to be very significantly impacted by the physical impact of climate change. And, and so ultimately not taking action today is, is creating a, a much greater bill for you in the future. Um, and, and I think, you know, we, with, with the Chinese government's announcement uh, in, in the autumn of last year that they were going to be net zero by 2060, I think we're, we're again cautiously optimistic that this is going to trickle uh, down in, into uh, some more robust policy action. Um, but certainly there, there is a long way to go. And, but I think uh, another thing to, that is, is key to, to, to keep in mind as well is that even though um, on a country basis, China and India are, are very significant emitters. Uh, on a per capita basis, uh, in in the UK and, and indeed in, in Scandinavia, where I'm from, which is is, is often very often to, to, touted as a you know very green economy, on a per capita basis, in terms of the consumption per uh, per head of of, of the population, uh, our individual footprint uh, is is still uh, very very significant on on a global scale. So I think. There is a lot um, to to continue to be done uh, within our own economies, and in, in terms of uh, encouraging the shift to a circular economy and 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 uh, um, re reducing sort of consumption and and so on. But it it, it certainly it's it's a very very live debate, and it's it's a very interesting topic, and it is something that we're keeping very closely uh, on top of together with um, uh, uh, both. Um, individually as Elgin, but also as part of, of investor joint investor initiatives to engage um, with Chinese financial institutions, their, their leading electric utilities, and, and indeed also in, in India. Okay, thank, thank you very much. It's interesting you say per capita, but I mean the population of Europe, again, is relatively small when you compare it to the billions of people that are um, sort of living, living in, in China. Um, and anyway, thank thank you very much for that, Yasmin. Any more questions from anybody? Yes, Chairman Chris Mallings, can I just yes, ask uh, um, a, a quick a quick one? Um, I've been reading a book recently um, called uh, "Investing to Save the Planet" by uh, Alice uh, Ross, who's a Financial Times journalist, and uh, it, it's interesting that uh, Sasha uh, gets uh, gets a mention. Uh, in it, of, uh, and in fact, one of his earlier slides sort of covered that um, um, when they were talking about um, um, uh, the, the the different oil companies, Dominion Energy and Rosnoff, uh, for example. But um, uh, the presentation uh, again shows the the benefits of of engagement. But I just wonder, and it's an issue that's that's, that's covered in the, the the Alice Ross book. Does does, in your view, dis, dis, disvestment um, actually send a stronger signal um, to uh, to companies rather than than engagement? Engagement, whilst clearly does have benefits, it's quite time consuming. So it's a bit like turning an oil tanker, if you pardon the, the sort of the pun around. And I just wonder whether divestment sends a stronger message. Um, to um, to some of these companies because if 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 larger numbers start um, to do that, then they're clearly going to be left with stranded uh, assets. Um, and I know it's part, uh, as we acknowledged earlier, perhaps that the 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 debate around engagement versus disinvestment is a much wider issue. But I just wonder whether, in your view, that uh, in certain circumstances, can have a much more powerful um, um, out outcome. Yeah, um, I mean, to be honest, I think it, it, it's it's an issue where where it, it's difficult to to give just one answer. And I think I'll, I'll come back to to what we said before that you know we we recognize that the oil and gas market in in a Paris line scenario is going to be smaller. You know, so you're likely to see uh, some consolidation. Um, the the companies that that are more resilient in in a well below two degree scenario that that those companies uh, essentially gobble up their their competitors and and you end up with a, a much more consolidated market. Uh, I think that that's a scenario that, that we view as as quite likely. 
Um, but I think in, in terms of diverse members' engagement, you know, to date, what we've seen, um, you know, because the the divestment initiatives have have been relatively narrow, have been have been relatively targeted. I think what we've seen is that companies really care about the publicity around it, so the public naming and shaming, being pointed out in the media by a key investor or by a key shareholder as a laggard on climate change and then having uh, us go public with saying we're voting against uh, the chair, the, the very top of the organization, because we simply do not believe uh, in, in your climate strategy. I think that, that public, being sort of publicly uh, shamed, if, if, if you will, is, is what we have seen uh, has been the most effective tool to date. Uh, and I'm sure, you know, speaking with, with other analysts, you'll, you'll get different answers. And I don't think there is, there is, there is one, but that is, that is what we have seen to date, that it, it is that a uh, leading shareholder being willing to go public with their views that, that we have seen ha has been really effective today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate that. Chairman, may I make, make just a, a, a small comment, please? Yes, uh, it's, it, it's something. It's something that you actually said about the uh, about the percentage of um, of carbon that we actually produce or make uh, in the UK, and we're all very concerned about uh, that. But of course, we are a highly industrialised society where people live in houses and um, and and mode, use modes of transport which are en energy rich. There are there are, as you point out, the the Chinas of the world, uh, Indonesia. And and some European countries also who are major contributors to to carbon emissions. Uh, there's another another country now come onto the onto the scale, which is South Africa, where now en energy uh, is is intermittent at best, uh, and whose economy is almost in junk status. Uh, they need energy as, as as much as they can, and whether we were able to influence, say, Barclays or whoever. Uh, 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 through their board uh, uh, to not support any more coal-fired power stations in South Africa, which they are building at a rate that, uh, of, of knots, um, then I don't think the South African government would be very concerned about whether we were concerned or anyone else for that matter, uh, because they would simply in their current mode take it over for themselves and continue to build. Um, I'm, I am certainly more concerned about the, the offenders um, such as China, India, Indonesia, Poland and Germany, uh, to, which are a bit closer to hand, and how you influ influence those states, because it is the states in so many cases that are the offenders. Uh, yes, we can we can wring our hands, and I think we all rightly do so in, in our own context, but we are not the offenders, we are not the producers of the worst, worst case scenarios. I just make that point, Chairman, and, and uh, appreciate um, Chris's reading. OK, th th thank you all very much. Well, I, th I think we'll bring this uh, this uh, issue, uh, this particular item to a close. And I, it's been a very interesting debate and I'd particularly like to thank Yasmin. And if Sasha has gone, please, Yasmin, could you pass on our thanks also to Sasha as well? Of course, of course. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. We'll now move on to item nine, the investment strategy update. And can I ask, please, uh, Louis Paul Hill from Aon to introduce himself and present this item, please. So I'm going to try. Can you can you hear me? We can. Yay. Uh, yeah. So Louis Paul Hill from investment consultant from Aon. Um, so the committee has done a lot of work on investment strategy over the last few months. We've had four um, workshops, each lasting around two hours, where we have um, provided the committee with quite detailed asset class training. Um, the aim of all this training has been uh, to enable a decision on the long term investment strategy of the, the fund. And by that, I mean the high level asset allocation. So James kind of referred to this earlier in response to a question. We're looking at how much the fund should allocate to equities versus bonds versus property and so on. Very high level. Um, the, the key things we need to talk about there are in terms of expected returns 
and risk. And climate risk is one of absolutely those, those risks in terms of the investments going forward. Mercer will provide detail on the implications of investment returns and risk on funding in terms of the deficit and the cost of accrual. We'll talk about it from an investment perspective and ultimately we'll decide an asset allocation in terms of those broad asset class buckets. As, as Justin and James have said, once we've decided that high level asset allocation, there are lots of discussions and decisions to be made in terms of implementation. You know, within our equity allocation, how much should be UK, how much should be global, how much should be, um, you know, should we disinvest or not? Within infrastructure, you know, similar discussions, what kind of infrastructure do we want to invest in? So all that is still to come. Today, it's all about the high level, how much in those broad asset classes. OK, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, have members got any questions for Louis at this stage? No? OK, well, in that case, thank you for that, Louis. Uh, we now move to item 10 on the agenda. This is the exclusion of press and public. Um, I move that under paragraph 10.2, of the Council's Access to Information Procedure Rules, that the proceedings That's of the committee in relation to agenda items 12 to 16 shall not be conducted in public on the grounds that they involve the likely disclosure of exempt information as defined by the categories specified against them. Uh, please may I have a seconder? Councillor Michael Wood. Thank you very much. We will now move into the private part of the agenda, unless anyone else indicates differently. No. OK, we will now move into the private part of the meeting. <laughs> 